So like, you know, some people will do, they'll combine two songs together. Sometimes I'll literally have two songs and they're both playing at the same time. Sometimes they align and that sounds really cool. And other times it's like really, really annoying because this song's playing this tune over here and this song's playing this tune over here. And I'm like, would you guys just shut up? If you would like to support the efforts and research we are doing here on this podcast, make a donation using the Buy Me A Coffee link in the show notes or go to buymeacoffee.com slash Shane's Brain. Thank you. Aphantasia is a condition characterized by an inability to visualize mental images in one's mind. If you have just discovered that you or someone you love has aphantasia, or if you're just fascinated by the subject in general and love learning more about it, you are in the right place. The Discovering Your Mind podcast delves into all aspects of the mind's eye, including aphantasia, hyperphantasia, and everything in between. Welcome to the Discovering Your Mind podcast, brought to you by shanesbraindomain.com. I am your host, Shane Williams, also known as Shane's Brain, and today we're talking with the one and only... Michelle Jeffries. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Good. I met Michelle briefly many years ago at a book festival. Do you remember that? I do remember. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, it's good to have you. Um, Why don't you go ahead and just tell us what you do for a living? Honestly, right now, I am a lunch lady. (laughs) All right. I make sure that kids get food at breakfast and lunch, and that's what I'm doing right now. And it's definitely not my career, but it's what pays. It's what's paying for the things that I really want to do. (laughs) All right. So, what would you really like to do? I would love to be a full-time author, artist. I just started school to go to uh, for art therapy. And so I'd like to do art therapy and, and art and writing. That would be my dream. And and that's where I'm heading. This The lunch lady is just a diversion. Right. So what is art therapy? Can you describe that to me? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Yeah. Art therapy is um, a way of using art, sand play, music, those kinds of things in order to process emotions. Um, I'm definitely not a therapist. I I don't have a degree or anything, but I can be trained and I'm working on being trained in using art and sound and um, those kinds of things in order to help facilitate processing for the body, emotions and stuff. Very cool. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people, especially since Bessel van der Kolk, came out with the book Body Keeps the Score, we have discovered that people don't store emotions in their mind. Emotions and trauma are not stored in your mind. They're stored in your body. After so many years of, say, trauma or um, bad experiences or things like that, your body will start to manifest what those emotions and those things that have been stored in your body a lot oftentimes it is it comes out as chronic fatigue fibromyalgia those kinds of things and when you process those emotions with your body with the help of a therapist as well but if you're processing those you can actually the, they can leave your body and you become healthier why don't you Uh, Tell us a little bit about your books. I write science fantasy. What I would describe science fantasy as is a little bit of a secret agent, James Bond type with a little bit of magic, um, a lot of world building, that kind of thing. That's what uh, the main genre I write. I have been dabbling, but I have not published young adult uh, coming of age. I'm still working on mastering that coming of age plot the plot line and so I haven't published anything in it yet because I'm just not I'm just not 100% sure that that's that my stories are where they need to be I did write two manners books when my children were little I wrote 
two books describing good manners and how to how to write a proper letter, a thank you note and invitations and how to set a table and stuff like that. I wrote one for boys and one for girls. Those are really my some of my favorite books. They, um, yes. They're really cool. They each chapter has a specific lesson in manners. And they each each chapter, both the boys book and the girls book have an activity and a recipe. So they're meant to be worked on chapter by chapter. So you spend a day, a, a day like reading about the manners and practicing them. And then you could do the recipe and the activity. It's really meant for moms, your know, parents and children to spend time together and learn something in a non-boring way and, and have something to look forward to at the end of the book. So that's some of my favorites. In fact, I had a couple of homeschool groups pick up my manners books to teach. Then you, they were using those as textbooks to oh, teach yeah. the kids in their right. homeschool groups manners. So that was a, that was a big accomplishment for me. That was, I felt like that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. And all of that can be found on your website, right? Yes, all of it can be found on my website, or if you Google C. Michelle Jeffries on Amazon, all of my books are there as well. Okay, uh, we'll put that website in the show notes. All right. In this episode, we will be referring to what we call the Apple Graph. If you would like to view the Apple Graph to play along and better understand what we're talking about, you can find it on shanesbraindomain.com in the Aphantasia and Beyond section. If you are unable to view the Apple Graph for whatever reason, it is a graph divided into six sections. In the number six section, there is a very detailed image of a red apple. In the number five section, it is the same image but with less detail. Number four is still in color but has less detail and more basic shapes instead of detailed hues and gradients. Number three is the less detailed apple but in gray tones without the color. Number two is a simple outline of the apple. And number one is blank, indicating no visualization whatsoever. This is called aphantasia. First thing I'd like you to do is imagine a red apple in your mind. All right, which one of those best represents what you saw in your mind's eye? Uh, mostly a one. Mostly a one. Mm-hmm. All right, what do you mean by mostly a one? Um, very occasionally, I can actually see like uh, like the number three was the grayscale. Occasionally, okay. I can see a little bit of grayscale. I the outline, I, I I don't see that. Mostly, it's between a one or a three, and mostly it's a one. Okay, very interesting. That's cool. How did you find out about aphantasia? Have you, I think you mentioned that you haven't always had it. Anyway, just tell your story. Yeah, I don't think I've always had it. I think the antiphasia for me has been as a result of trauma. My brain, because of PTSD, my brain has changed the way it functions. I, I don't remember ever seeing, really seeing images. So I don't know whether it is congenital or acquired. I think it's more somewhere in, in the middle of that. I close my eyes. I can't see anything but black. However, occasionally, and that's why I'm saying that that grayscale one comes mm -hmm. in. I don't know if people other than me, and maybe I'm just weird, if I do see some sort of image like a grayscale, it's definitely not here in the front. It's more back here in like the cortical area where, where I can, I, if I can see something, it's that, that area which I've always thought is really weird. I learned about it probably about three or four years ago when I started into more natural healing and started to learn about art therapy. And I think it was more of, oh, you guys can actually picture something in your head, whereas I've never really been able to. Okay, so my first question is, when you talk about acquiring it, but you're not 100% sure on that, can you think about think back to when maybe you, you you could visualize better? It was like as a child, was it different? Can you elaborate any more on that? I was, had a really, really vivid imagination when I was a little kid. And my memory is faulty because of trauma as well. 
but I, I, I remember being very creative and very had a very vivid imagination, had imaginary friends and all those kinds of things. But I experienced my first trauma episode at age 10. My memory, my short term memory, my uh, creativity, all of those kinds of things started to change around that time. And so by the time that I was able to that I was not experiencing trauma in my life on a daily basis, I went from being able to see things in my head and and just off the top of my head, be so creative and, and tell stories and all these kinds of things. But by the time I um, by the time I was a young adult and had experienced some so much other trauma, those kinds of things were gone. I can write a story if I know the plot. I can write a story of 60,000 words in 17 days. But if I don't know that story, if I if somebody says, here, here, I'm going to give you a story prompt. You know, here's your story prompt. You've got two hours. I can sit there and go, um, no idea, because my brain just doesn't work the same as it did before. My teenage brain and my adult brain are just two completely different things. It, it's a lot harder to pull a story out of my head now. Whereas back when I was 17 years old, I had notebooks and notebooks and notebooks full of ideas. Okay. So when you say, if I know the story, what does that mean? Like, where does the story come from? Two things. Uh, one, uh, there's two ways that I write. If the character is a really strong character and already has good background and stuff like that, a lot of times the character will just run with the story. And I'm literally typing as fast as I can, trying to keep up with whatever that character's doing in, in what's happening in my head. The second way is I must more often than not, I'm a plotter. I used to pants everything. And I don't know if your readers know the difference between plotting and pantsing. I used to just write by the skin of my teeth, you know, whatever happens. But I learned how to plot and that changed everything about writing for me. All of a sudden, I was able to complete an actual story, beginning, middle, end, where I have a character arc and I have... I have world building that is complete and I've got a plot that's beginning, middle and end rather than me just droning on for 200,000 words and going, oh, right. I need to edit this. And that's that's one way I do it. But the other way and I, there are a few characters in my head. I do write series and there are a few characters in my head. And this is what we were talking about. They have a complete mind of their own. They, they live in my head that they have a, a life and a conversations and all these things outside of me thinking about them. And occasionally I will get on a story. I will hit a storyline and that character is just like, bam, gone. And I am. I'm, I'm running behind them at 100 miles an hour with a notebook and a pen going, OK, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because they're just they're They have a mind of their own, literally. But that's rare. There's only a few characters in my head that can do that. Uh, but those characters also, I'll be sitting there doing something. I'm not even not even writing words. I'm sitting there doing something like lunch, you know, preparing lunch or doing paperwork or something. And I'll think of something. And one of those characters, one of those really strong characters will be like, oh, yeah, right, whatever. Or they'll make some sort of sarcastic comment. I'm like, would you, you know, go on. Yeah, I, I'm busy here kind of thing. Yeah, I, I joke that I have a safety glass in my head. There's there's a piece of safety glass and the, most of the characters have to stay behind the safety glass because otherwise I've got this going on in my head all the time. Wow. So OK, uh, I want to talk about that a little more because I find it so fascinating. When when you were first talking about uh, characters you know, having a mind of their own and writing the story for you. I, I mean, I've heard authors say that before. Uh, I've never experienced that. And one of the things I assumed when you were talking about that is that you were a highly visual person. And then I find out that you have a fantasia and the characters themselves. Did you create them? Yeah. A interesting story, too. Um, some of the characters I created. I've had, since high school, I've had this 
a secret agent, you know, bad boy turned good. Because that's that's kind of my theme is how do you take a bad boy, an assassin, an atheist assassin, and turn him into a good guy? And that's the the process of the stories for some of my stories. I created uh, Noble Standing. It, that's his that's his name, and he is one of those characters. That even though I created him, I you know in my head I'm like, okay, here's this guy. This is what he looks like, and and this is what he does, and this is this is. You know, like this is okay. This is his favorite cereal, and this is this is what he wears. This is the kind of clothes he wears, and all those kinds of things. I created him, and I s- threw him in this world. And I I did create a few other characters, but then as I'm going along, I'm writing this story, and all of a sudden, this other character just bam pops up, and I'm like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa wait a minute, where are you, where, where'd you come from? Kind of thing. When I wrote Emergence, the very first, my very first published novel, the first version of Emergence, I wrote it and I had Noble met and ended up falling in love and marrying a character named Lyris. And so I've got this character, I've got this storyline, and I send it off to my editor and my editor comes back. And this is really, it's kind of funny because she goes, you know, I, I love the story. I love this and that about it, but you have to make your assassin likable. And I'm like, but he's an assassin. I, he, he's an atheist. He's an assassin. How am I supposed to make him likable? And so I went back to the drawing board, pulled out my, my papers and my books and, and my plot lines and worked and worked, re- reworked this story and so in the process, I went, aha, okay, I've got my solution. So what I did was I introduced him because he had to make a 180 degree change. And so I inter- what I did was I gave him a first wife. So before, so he was actually in the, the story changed and he actually ended up being married to a woman named Elite before Lyris. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is really cool. This is going to work so well. And um, this is going to be really cool. And Lyris, who is originally the original first wife, she literally walked out of my head. She's like, "Uh uh-uh, you're not going to do this to me. And walked out of my head, would not talk to me, would not give me storyline, would not do any of those kinds of things that was basically just completely un uncooperative and i'm like i need to be writing your story i need to be working on this story she's like nope i'm gone and she seriously was gone for about four weeks and i'd say hey you ready nope are you gonna talk to me nope and i'm like oh come on please you know work with me here and it was funny because when she came back she was a completely different character she had been passive and kind of a little bit broken and really permissive, basically. She let the story happen to her when the first version that I wrote, she was a very passive character and the story happened to her all the time. When she came back, she was literally a kick butt sword master. And she comes in and the very first scene that we see her in, in the new story, in the new version of the book, she's on an airplane, There's a a hostage situation. The guy is trying to take the plane down with a bomb and she drives a sword through his chest and saves the plane. And I'm typing this scene and I finish the scene and I'm like, well, you're definitely not the same character that left my head. And so that's a lot of what I deal with. I have no control over them at all. Wow. That's fascinating. If they're not visual, how are they manifesting in your mind? I mean, she left, she came back. Is it just, is it audible? Is that how it's they're... audible? Yeah, it, they're audible. And then there's also, um, instead of, say, so say somebody would see their character in their head, that they'd see, oh, he's six foot four, blonde, this and this and this. I don't see it, but I see it in words. Like the word, a, tra- a trail of words will come go through my head character this is a character's name this is what he looks like this is what they do this and this but most of it's audible and is that part visual um you say you see the name 
I don't. It's just it's just words that I might I either hear them or I hear just my own brain producing words. Okay. That is really cool. Thanks for going into that detail on that. The next thing I'd like you to do is imagine a horse in your mind. Is it like looking at a picture or more of just a thought or something else? You say imagine a horse and for a moment I can actually see like a magazine picture of a horse. How much of a moment? Is it just like a flash? A flash, literal flash. Trying to picture something in my head, it just doesn't happen. But you say, imagine this or think about this. And for a brief moment, I can see something. Okay. Have you ever heard of hypophantasia? I haven't. There's basically four different areas. There's aphantasia, which there's no visualization whatsoever. Hypophantasia is low, very low. It's close to aphantasia, but they can have some. And I think that's where you're at. And then there's fantasia where people can visualize. And then there's hyperfantasia where they can do it on a very extreme level. I'm going to read the definition of hypophantasia. And you can tell me if... That sounds like maybe where you're at. Okay. It's hard to pin down any of this, really. Yeah. <laughs> we try. All right. Uh, hypophantasia is characterized by a low visual imagination. People with hypophantasia have described experiences where visual imagery is sometimes completely absent, or sometimes the visual imagery is very vague and fleeting. They often s- struggle to create mental images in their mind but they sometimes report experiencing very brief flashes of more detailed mental images in their mind. What do you think? I think that's what it is, because there are brief flashes. With the image of the horse, uh, was the image still or was there movement? Still. Okay. Was it isolated or was there a background? There was a background. It was a brown horse with a like grass behind it. Okay. Were the colors vibrant or muted? Uh, for the flat moment of that flash moment, it was vibrant and then it fades. Okay. Is the image more clear with your eyes closed or your eyes open? I don't think it matters. Okay. So you can get the like, you can get those flashes like, either way? Yeah. If I close my eyes and like really try to focus, then it's not happening at all. It's a very subconscious flash and then it's gone. Okay. Would you say the flash is in your mind or is it projected out in front of you? It's definitely in my mind. It's happening in the back. Was the image 2D or 3D? 2D. Is there any way you can manipulate an image? For example, could you put a birthday hat on the horse if you wanted to? Yes, I can. Okay. How, so how does that work? Is that just a new flash with a yeah. birthday hat on it? Yes. And it's interesting, as I'm thinking about it, when I recall an image, when I actually have a flash of an image or recall an image, it is never a... Um, original image that like I've created in my brain. It is more of a memory of like a picture in a magazine or a picture I've seen in a book or on TV or, or a film or something. And I think it's more, it's a recall, it's a recall thing rather than generation. But you can generate things, right? Like you've, you said you've created characters and things like that. Are those ever visual? Do you ever get flashes of of those things? Or is it only flashes of things you've seen before? It's only flashes of things I've seen before. And my characters will be, my characters are very, I don't know. I want to say amorphous, but I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, My characters are very undescribable until I find an image somewhere in, in the world. To okay. that and then all of a sudden like okay um my my character noble standing i know he's tall he's six foot two he's got long blonde hair muscly 
those kinds of things. But I past that, I cannot tell you anything else about him. I, I can't see anything else. But as I'm dry, as I'm looking through the internet or looking through pieces, uh, images and stuff, or watching a movie, all of a sudden, Chris Hemsworth as Thor, the longer hair, right. and um, all of a sudden, I'm like, ah, oh, that's him, <laughs> and that's where I get my characters from. Uh. Is all of a sudden, I'll say, oh wow, that's okay. That's what he looks like. I can't imagine it in my head, but I can go, ha, ah, there we go. But that's literally how I how I can keep track of what my characters look like is because they look like someone that that is well known or popular or even just an image. Sometimes it's just a picture of someone, and I'm like, oh, there's my character because I literally cannot imagine them in my head. Okay, awesome, very cool detail. Thank you. Uh, so back to the horse. Um, you said it was a still image. Could you add movement to it, or could you imagine? a flash with with a horse running okay i can see him walking oh and i can get a very brief like microsecond of an image of a horse uh, running like a race it is uh like an image from like kentucky derby type where it, it is a vision it is a memory recall but interestingly i did not think i could do this but i can actually make that horse walk for a few seconds in my head <laughs> okay that's cool. All right. If the horse made a sound, could you hear it in your mind? Oh, definitely. All right. Um, the next thing is sequence visualization. Okay. So now I'd like you to imagine a cup on a table that you accidentally knock over. What type of cup was it? Um, actually, it's a water bottle. Okay. Because I just – see, and this is funny. It's, it's recall. Because I just right. did this like a couple days ago. I knocked over a water bottle on the table. <laughs> right. So your mind just went directly right to something that was fresh in your mind. Yeah. Okay. So did that appear as a, a flash as well? Could you see it or was it more of a thought? That one was more of a memory, like a memory recall. So what type of table was it? Did you see a table? Yeah, I did, but I it was so brief. Okay, and I could I could describe to you my table because of what it ha it was it, that if it's memory recall, then I can describe my table to you. But I didn't okay. see it. Okay, so that's interesting. So, in the flash itself, could you tell any colors like the color of the water bottle, or is it more that you're just you know what? They are in reality, so you can pull the details from there. Uh, it's more that than I know what it was in reality. And interestingly, I write my very first drafts of any of my books are completely void of physical description, se uh, sensory description, scene description, any of that. It, it is literally action and dialogue. And then I have to go back through in my writing I have to go back through and literally do a sensory edit and a description edit and an emotional edit. Wow. Because I just don't, because of how my brain functions. Right. Yeah, that's and interesting. And honestly, those are the three hardest edits that I ever do because yeah. of that. Like, oh, speaking of, okay, here we go. You asked me this earlier. Back when I was in junior high, so 13 12, 13, 14, around there, I used, I've, I've been a writer since I was about 10 years old. And back in 13, 14 years old, I was writing stories that were highly, highly descriptive. Lots of description, sometimes even over describing. And after that, about somewhere around that 16, 15, 16 years old, all of that description left my writing. I, can, I remember that now. I can I can remember the difference between this writing here and this writing here. So with that quick mental image of the cup tipping over, uh, did you hear it as well? Was there sound attached to that? Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, actually, but it was um, it was probably still memory recall because there was a cuss word, okay. and there was and there was the sound of water spilling. 
Things are pleasant in the little town of quiet until Mel Beezer discovers he's allergic to his own sneezes. Blending wit and humor with lively imagery, The Endless Achoo is a delightfully clever tale. Available on Shane'sBrainDomain.com and Amazon. Now we're going to move on to perspective visualization. All right. I'd like you to imagine any room, any room at all. And can you imagine all four walls at once? I can't. What about all four walls and all four corners at once? Okay, I can imagine it in the fact that I'm sitting here going, okay, there's a room, it has four walls, it has four corners. I am creating it because I'm a thought process, but I cannot visualize it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you zoom outside of the room to imagine the entire exterior of the building? I actually, I, when I zoomed out, I was able to see, like I passed through the wall and I was able to see like the wood structure underneath the sheetrock and then it disappeared. I could not go farther than that. Okay. Very interesting. That little thing you described to me, that was visual. Okay. That was. It was. And you, it got, was, uh, and you got stuck in the wall. Yeah, I got stuck in the wall. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. Does effort play a role in how well you can visualize something? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, like I described before, the those the very specific detail edits, that takes a ton of effort for me to do. In general, when you close your eyes, what do you see? Black. Complete black. Okay. Can you think of nothing if you want to? Uh, after years of practice with meditation, I, yes, I can. <laughs> okay. Do you have an inner monologue? Constantly. Okay. Can you describe what that is? Because I found that that is a term that means something different to everybody. So describe what your inner monologue is. I literally talking to myself. All pretty much all day long. I, that that is how I process things. That is how I remember things. That is how I go about my daily life. I'll remember to do this, or you know, uh, okay, I need to I need to remember to do this. I've got to do this, or okay, we're going here, so this is where I need to go. This is this is I need to go. Turn right here. Turn right here. Go here. What was I thinking about? And I literally have my own voice in my head almost constantly monologuing with me telling me this so that i tell myself jokes all the time i'm laughing at myself all the time because i think i'm pretty funny um but i also have you know there's a meme that says um i have in my brain i have like 168 tabs open and four of them are playing music and i don't know which ones they are right Right. So that's part of it. If I'm not monologuing, I have music going through my head all the time. It could be like I'm walking along, I'm doing something and I'm I could be playing a song in my head that I hadn't heard for 30 years. And all of a sudden this song pops up from, you know, from way back in that memory of mine. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I haven't heard this for, you know, for 30 years. So there's music is going on. Sometimes I'll actually have two songs. So like, you know, some people will do, they'll combine two songs together. Sometimes I'll literally have two songs and they're both playing at the same time. Sometimes they align and that sounds really cool. And other times it's like really, really annoying because this song's playing this tune over here and this song's playing this tune over here. And I'm like, would you guys just shut up? (laughs) I'm not a very musical person, but every once in a while, I just will have my own tune. Something I've never heard anything, I've never heard before, but my brain will just make it something up. And so I'll be jumping along, hum- humming along, whatever, to some strange song that I've composed in my own head. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, cool. and character-wise, on top of my own monologue, I have my characters. And sometimes okay. they'll be telling me stories, and sometimes... 
I was literally, I'll be sitting there trying to do something and I've got Noble over here talking and he's telling somebody something. And then over here is another character. And this, this, this character is from one book. This character is from another book. And I'm like, you guys shouldn't even know each other because you exist in two completely different universes. And they're like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we have dinner together and uh, whatever. And I, oh, why? Wow. I, my characters have a lot of fun without me. <laughs> but they're in my head. So- so do they have their own unique voices? Yes, they do. Sometimes I will actually, I'll hear somebody speak and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's definitely really close to what I, what I hear in my head as a character's oh. voice. So as you're describing that, you said it's pretty constant, like it never shuts up. But you also said that you can get to nothing. So is that what you mean by when you meditate? You're able to quiet all that noise. I am able to quiet all of that. Yes. It takes a long time. (laughs) Right. Right. I can imagine. I'm also one of the, one of the strange things about me is I cannot ignore anything. And I'm wondering if that is part of the reason I have a constant monologue in my head. I cannot ignore, like I'm sitting here talking to you and I can feel my shirt on my shoulders and my necklace and my glasses are on my head and I'm the, and my hair on my shoulders and my pa- my pa- jeans on my legs and my toes. I can never ignore that unless I'm meditating. It, it is wow. a constant sensory input for me. And then to, like noise, I work at, I work in a kitchen, you know, so I've got two coworkers. I've got a delivery driver that so two or three times a day is coming and bringing in stuff. I've got fans, oven. I've got regular fans, oven fans, the bathroom fan, refrigerator. All, all these things are going on, and I can't ignore any of them oh, because wow. it's constant sensory input for me. I would actually love to not have all that sensory input. <laughs> are the sounds automatically attached to your visualization, or are they optional? I would say optional. I, my visualization is very separate. You already talked a little bit about this, but what does the phrase, I have a song stuck in my head, mean to you? It could mean anything from, this is really cool, to this is very annoying, please shut it off. A lot of it will be uh, bass line uh, looping or the chorus looping through, unless it's Bohemian Rhapsody. And then if it's Bohemian Rhapsody, I have to hear the entire song all the way through. (laughs) All right. So when it comes to mind audio, on a scale from one to 10, how much is it like actual hearing? For me, it feels like it's really very similar to actual hearing. Can you imagine a song that involves multiple instruments and vocals? Yes. Can you hear all of the instruments or just some of them? I can hear all of them. Can you hear tonal changes as the melody plays out? Yes. Can you change the tempo by speeding it up and slowing it down? Yes, I can. Can you imagine switching instruments in and out? For example, can you hear a guitar as a trumpet? No, I can't. Okay. Can you make the singer sound deeper and higher at will? Uh, No, I can't. Imagine that uh, the singer just sucked in a bunch of helium. (laughs) Could Could you hear that? Yeah, but it, is, it would take it would take some effort to do it. It's not that would definitely not be an automatic um, an automatic thing. Okay, can you imagine Yoda singing the song instead? Um, unless you count the grammatical syntax, I can hear his voice, but right. I, can, I could not I could not do his syntax. <laughs> right, that's why I picked Yoda because I'm interested in seeing how that would work. Yeah. Right. If I sat down and actually like wrote it out, you know, and, and made an effort to do it, I could probably do it, but it would have to be actually hand on paper. Can you imagine the song played in a different genre? For example, a metal song played as bluegrass. Yes, but again, that would take a little bit of effort on me. It wouldn't be an automatic thing. All right, let's talk about some of the other senses. So now I'd like you to imagine a chocolate chip cookie in your mind. Can you smell it in your mind? No, I can't. What about taste? Can you taste it in your mind? I can taste it, though. Okay. On a scale from 1 to 10, how much is like actual tasting? 
it's not it's more probably three or four it's more of a memory what about the sensation of touch you said before you're highly sensory can you experience the feeling of touch in your mind yes i can you say, in so, fact you said chocolate chip cookie and instead of smelling it or tasting it i could feel the texture in my mouth okay all right so what about that one on a scale from one to ten that's Which probably is, up there at about a seven eight imagine that you grow an extra finger out of your hand are you, are you able to do that at all as soon as you said extra finger i immediately felt it oh yeah really yeah and on my right hand i could feel like an extra finger right here just as soon as you said that i could feel like I can still do it. I, I'm still feeling it. Oh, wow. So in my head, there's like an extra finger. So yeah, I can. And you, and you can feel it like, you're, like mm -hmm. your other fingers feel. Yeah, I can touch it and I can bend it. Oh. And stuff. Oh, wow, so cool. I didn't even, I had never even thought about that. Thank you. That's so cool. Yeah. What about wings? Could you add wings to yourself and feel that in your shoulders? Yes. And, and then can you make them pump and take you up off the ground? Can you feel how that would feel? Yeah, I can. And interesting enough, I can feel as I'm sitting here thinking of the wings moving, I can feel through my torso, my core, I can feel my muscles change, like flexing in order to spread the wings. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now imagine that you stub your toe. Can you feel the pain? Yes, I can. Now imagine that someone else stubs their toe. Can you feel the pain on their behalf? Yes, I can. You know those videos? My kids love them. The videos you can find on YouTube of the uh, people like crashing their bikes. Right. And you know, like water skiing and, and all those kinds of things where they're crashing and hurting themselves. I cannot watch them. It literally causes me physical pain. A lot of people, they say, develop a more empathic ability from trauma because trauma causes them to be so hypersensitive that mm -hmm. they notice things like that and they can actually feel somebody else's pain, but it's based, it's because of experiencing trauma in your early childhood. So I don't know, but that's just, uh, that's one of those things that's talked about in that world. In this episode, we will be referring to what we call the nature picture. If you would like to view the nature picture to play along and better understand what we're talking about, you can find it on shanesbraindomain.com in the aphantasia and beyond section. If you are unable to take a look at the nature picture, it is a picture of a grove of tall trees with the sun shining brightly through the trees. There is a blue camping chair next to a peaceful flowing river with a campfire nearby. All right, do you have that uh, nature picture that I sent you? Yes. Uh, can you put yourself in that picture? No, I can't. Let's try some of the other senses, since you right. have those better, and see if you can get there. Can you experience the weather in your mind? Can you feel the sun on your skin or the wind in your hair or anything like that? I did. As soon as I looked at the picture, I could feel the sun, the warmth. And okay. I, could, I could smell... Like I could smell the, the dirt and the trees. What about the river? Could you hear the river? Yes, I could hear the river and birds and leaves, like leaves rustling and birds singing and the, the water running. I could hear that. Okay. Could you put your hands in the river or your feet in the river and feel that? Yes, I could. Okay. I can also, for a moment, because I, I don't like dirt. I even though even though I love house plants, I really don't like dirt. I could feel like the dirt underneath my feet, and I, my first reaction was like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> that just blows my mind. Uh, what about the campfire? Could you smell it? Could you hear it? Could you feel it? Yes, and I could also feel the texture of the camp chair. Okay. So other than physically looking at that picture, there was no other visualization. 
I looked at the picture and I could I could feel smell those kinds of things, but I I, I I couldn't even literally put myself in that in that picture. Okay. Out of the five senses, which one is most prominent or powerful in your mind? Probably auditory, my hearing. Okay. All right, let's talk about reading. When you read a novel, is it like a movie in your mind or something else? Uh, no, it is a procession of thoughts that go through my head as I'm reading. Okay. It, it almost, I, I, when I read, it's almost like uh, I'm listening to an audiobook, but I'm narrating it in my own head. Okay. So you're, the narration is in your own voice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What about the characters' voices? Do they take on voices of their own? It depends. If I'm really involved in the story, then yes, I will develop, my, my brain will create voices. Or if I'm reading, if I'm rereading my own stuff, whether it's I'm editing or something like that, then I do definitely hear different voices. If someone shoots off a gun or slams a door or something, can you hear those sound yes. effects? Yes, I can. And I've actually startled myself where like I'll be reading a book and it'll say the door slammed open. And I'm like, huh, because I'm so in, I'm so into that. And that's one of those senses I can hear the door or something like that. I, I will, it will actually startle me. What about audio books? Do you like audio books? Um, I love them. I just haven't had a lot of time. I don't, I don't listen a lot because I'll turn one on and then all of a sudden it's like a, a distract me radar turns on when I listen. So I'll turn on an audio book and all of a sudden the dogs are barking and the kids are going, mom, and the phone is ringing. Where it's so much easier for me to place myself uh, to stop, know where I stopped in a book or uh, those kinds of things. Audio is just really hard for me. If I knew that I had uh, three hours that I was not going to be interrupted at all, I could definitely get into an audiobook. What does the phrase, the book was better than the movie, mean to you? One of the ways is that there's just so much more in a book than in than you can portray in a movie. And, and that includes narration. And I think one of the things that makes a book better is your own interpretation what what's going on in your brain as you're reading it the narration voices the um the ability for characters to break the fourth wall in a in a book even if they're not meant to be you're the, sometimes a character can break a fourth wall and and you're literally being dragged through the story in a in a book rather than watching it on screen and so there's those two ways that the book can be much better than a movie. Okay. So since when you read a book, there's really not a whole lot of visual going on. Do you like that aspect of the movie that you can actually see the action and, and things like that? Or does yes. that not matter? Yeah, I do. I do like when I get, um, see the movie. But I also, I don't, whether it's just my enjoyment of reading and that the whatever's going through my brain, which is it's obviously not visualize, vis, visualization. Good grief. Can I speak today? But whatever is happening in my brain, that line, that line of um, audio that's going through my head as I'm reading, I, I really do enjoy that. Uh, now we're going to talk about sleep and dreams. What do you do to fall asleep? That's one of my biggest times that I actually have um, practiced that uh, meditation, getting things out of my head. Because like I said, I've, I've got a constant audio going in my head. I can't ignore anything. I can't ignore my, even when I go to sleep, I, you know, I can't ignore that my head's on my pillow and my blankets are laying on my shoulder and, right. and my toes are cold or, <laughs> or this or that. There's two ways that I that I fall asleep. And one is to literally take everything out of my brain so I can actually finally rest. Or which the funniest one is start thinking about my books. You know, what 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 is the you know, what is the next scene I need to write? What is the 
you know, how can I work on the plot of this book? And I fall asleep immediately. Do you dream? No, not very much. Maybe once every two, three months, I'll remember a dream. And then it has to be so, so weirdly disturbing or profound that I actually think about it and remember it. Are they visual? Yeah, my dreams are very visual. Your dreams are visual. How yeah. vivid and detailed are they? They can be very vivid and detailed. I do dream in color. Um, there's a lot of audio going on. There's a lot of um, tactile going on in my dreams. Are your dreams in first person or third person? Most of the time they're in first person, although I have had a couple of third person dreams where I'm floating above the situation per se and watching what's happening. And there's narration going on. Oh, wow. So you actually hear the narration in the dream yes, as well? Yes, I do. And I compose a lot of music in my dreams too. And I, like I said, I only remember maybe once every two to three months a dream. But I'll remember a dream and there's like a soundtrack in it. And that it's, is so cool. It's original composition. <laughs> in fact, I dreamt once that there was a song. And just as I was waking, the song was playing. And I could hear, I could hear the bass line, I could hear the melody, I could hear the words, I could hear the chorus, I could hear all of the instrumental stuff going into this song. And and for the longest time, like 10, 15 minutes after I woke up, this song was going through my head and through my head and through. I even knew the title of the song. I could see like the album cover and knew the title of the song. And I'm like, I love this song. I want to find it. I looked everywhere. <laughs> I looked, I looked on YouTube. I looked on Spotify. I looked everywhere for this darn song. I composed it in my head. There's no such thing as it. And now it's gone because I don't remember, I don't remember it now. And I'm like, dang, that was a really good song. <laughs> that is so cool because I've heard, I've heard musicians tell similar stories where they dreamt they're on stage, you know, and they're playing and then they wake up and they realize that that song doesn't exist. And then they compose it, right? Yeah, and I would but, have no clue how to compose. <laughs> when you're dreaming, do you know you're dreaming? Yes, I'm a, I am a lucid dreamer. Okay. So are you aware of your thoughts when you're dreaming? Uh-huh. If you want to recall a memory, can you see it in your mind? Uh, like I said, for brief flashes, I can. But okay. um, it's more of a... You know, like someone will say, do you remember, do you remember doing this? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll see a brief flash of the actual memory, but it's more of a, oh yes, we did. Yeah. Do you remember this? Oh yes, we did this and this and this, and you did this. And it's interesting because like, I'll bring up details that other people don't remember about that memory. You said this, or you were wearing, I remember you were wearing a blue shirt or you said, this, but it's not that it's an image. It's that what my brain has processed and told myself. Right. About. So do you feel like you can relive a memory or is it more just like revisiting, what, maybe watching it for a brief second, knowing the details? Can you relive I don't it? Reli yeah, I don't relive. I don't relive memories. I, I will see something for a brief second. That's one of the reasons, interestingly enough, I um, I was going through um i had i go to therapy for the ptsd and um emdr doesn't work for me because i can't really literally recall that memory and relive the memory in order to process it so right. we use instead of using emdr we use art for me and that is even really hard for me because she's like okay imagine this and i'm like ah, i'm trying <laughs> Right. That's one of the reasons that I decided to go into like art therapy and somatic somatic uh, movement and those kinds of things, because processing trauma would did not for that using somatic processing and those kinds of things didn't require me to either imagine something or for me to relive a memory. I can think of a situation or a trauma that happened to me and then I can scribble or I can finger paint or I can play with sand or I can turn my music up really loud and either just listen as the bass drum and the bass guitar 
processes for me, or I can start dancing or something. But that's how I process. I do cannot do, I cannot do traditional EMDR. Is there emotion attached to your memories? Yes, there is. Okay. Do you experience your memories in first person, third person, or both? Third person, actually. It's like I'm watching it again, only I'm hovering above it or something. Okay. So when you have a flash of the memory, it's in third person. Mm -hmm. But I do feel the emotions as if I was in first. Right. All right. Uh, Mind storage. How would you describe how your mind stores information? I would describe it as a big filing, like a big filing room, like you'd see in a doctor's office. And you literally have to go in there, find the memory, open it up. And that you, and then you'd get that flash or you'd have that. I want to say uh, written, they like written in my head memory of, of it. It would be like a big filing room. Okay. But it's not visual. It's not visual, but that's how I would describe it. Okay. Because I so, would literally, for me to remember something, I'm literally going to have to go and like find that memory and pull it out and examine it. Right. So that's what I was going to ask you. Like the phrase that we have in our society is search your mind, right? So you feel like you can actually do that. You can search your mind. Mm-hmm. How is it searching the files? Is it searching by keyword? Is it searching? Like, how is it searching? I would say keyword would be a really good description of it. Somebody says, oh, do you remember that? And I'm going back and thinking, I, I'm definitely, it's not a visual thing for me. Oh, do you, you know, do you remember when this happened? And my is, it is literally stored as words in my head. So, so say, do you remember, do you remember what happened two years ago on Christmas? And I would literally be going in my head and going two years ago, Christmas, that would have been 2022, what was I doing? Okay, this, I was this old. I was, um, this is how many kids we had in the house at that point in time. And it's literally a uh, word, it's a word association almost type thing where I'm looking for words to describe. And maybe that's why I'm a writer is I'm looking for those words to describe what I remember and what I'm thinking and what I'm processing rather than seeing things. Right. But they are group, kind of grouped together, mm-hmm. those details. Yeah. Like I can, uh, like almost like I can pull open a file and I can see, I can, I can not see, I use see because we use that word a lot, but I right. can say, okay, these are the details of that, of that day. Almost like a journal entry. This is what right. we did. And, and, and that's so I'm looking at that. And those are the details that I can recall from that day but it's all like a journal entry, not as anything visual. That is really cool. Um, what about school? Did you do well in school or did you struggle? I struggled in school a lot. Okay. Do you think the visualization aspect played any role in that? I do. I think a lot. Because I did up, and, up until maybe third, fourth grade, I did really well in school. And that at that point in time after that, I really I really struggled in school I was highly distractible like I said I can't ignore my clothing I can't ignore in a classroom I can't ignore that these kids are out there in the hall talking opening and closing lockers I can't ignore the scratch of the um, chalk on the chalkboard and um, memory wise I, I still to this day I'm 54 years old and I do not have my multiplication facts memorized never learned them because for me, that um, that type of memorization just didn't it didn't click with me. When you're talking about memories of other things, you're like, okay, here's the date. This is what happened. It's very easy for you to uh, pull up those type of memories. But then, when it comes to memorizing multiplication or something like that, there's like there's just a wall there for yeah. some reason. Right? <laughs> yeah, and I hear that kind of thing a lot. I don't have any explanation for it. But. Yeah. Uh, One last question. All right. If you were to try and give a general description of how your mind works and what you see in your mind's eye, how would you describe it? There is a musical machine that a Danish guy built. 
there's a YouTube video and he is literally, he's got a crank. It's a wooden machine. He's got a crank and he's cranking it. And this crank is pushing a, a conveyor belt that has pegs on it. And these marbles are being held on pegs and as they're being pulled up this thing and then dropping down, they're hitting at specific times because the pegs are timed. They're hitting xylophone keys and creating a melody. So he's cranking over here and he's got the thing that's going around and the marbles are dropping on the um the marbles are dropping on the xylophone. And then over here, he's got a couple of cymbals that he can control with his feet. And over here, he's got some electric guitar strings. And so he's got he's he's got the crank and he's got the thing that's going here and he's got the cymbals that are going here and he's got the electric guitar that's going over here. And he, all these things, that's my brain. Always something going on. <laughs> that's how I would describe it. Okay, very good. It has been really enlightening to talk to you because I have never, I've known that like I can't visualize things, but I've never talked in depth to anybody about it. So this has been really uh, mind blowing for me, basically. Right. And that's why I called the podcast discovering your mind because yeah, yeah we, we just never think about this stuff. We never talk about it until, you know, we sit down and, and develop some questions and actually try and figure it all out. So, yeah. All right. Have a fantastic uh, evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. All right. Goodbye. All right. Bye. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, follow, and engage with us and share it with your friends and family as we continue to explore this fascinating subject. For additional information about this episode or Shane's Brain, check out the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Discovering Your Mind podcast. You are beautifully unique.